are going to get through this. Easy for this. I was able to do it. I'm not a guy who has a cat. That's my fear. You're a disgrace, you are. Don't hate me. That's my fear. You're a disgrace, you are. That's my fear. You're a disgrace, you are. Hello and welcome to One on One Shadow Boxing. Have your say. Today, my guest at WTV Studios, Jerry Georgiatis, who is a suicide prevention researcher. Jerry, I know that we are got a high ranking on the suicide list in the world. Why is that, and what's our position? According to the World Health Organization, um, its latest report, which is actually 2014, Australia ranks 64th in the world proportion population in terms of suicides. Uh, Australia is actually um, a high-income nation, 12th largest economy on the planet, one of the wealthiest nations per capita, has a high public health quotient only behind Norway. So ranks second only behind Norway yet. Um, there's a lot of multifactorial issues and stresses that are afflicting especially our young people. It's a leading cause of death for um, our youth. 14 to 18 year olds. So the suicide is the leading cause. It's not for the, the leading people. cause of death. It's a leading cause of death. But for the elderly, uh, it's actually at a higher rate. The highest rates are actually found amongst the um, 70 plus years old, and uh, actually uh, uh, 80 to 85 year olds actually have the highest suicide rate. Males in particular. What do you think? Why is that? Why the elderly has got that sort well, of look, habit? If we look at it in terms of life expectancy, they've lived a, a long life. And uh, there's also the argument these days of euthanasia, about ending your life and coming to closure. So there's a lot of uh, uh, pain management issues. There's the factor of isolation, having lost a partner, and, uh, and having to deal with those psychological uh, stressors. Uh, but I would like to make a comparison. Yes. Uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, who are less than 3% of our total population, they don't live to be 80 years of age in terms of the life expectancy medians. Much uh, less than much, that. Much, much less. Uh, the uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics, because of the way they treat the statistical narrative, and, and uh, will argue that they live 10 to 15 years less than the rest of the population. But in real terms, and when we disaggregate the uh, regions of this country, uh, uh, well, they live 20 and 30 years less. 20 and 30 years less. For them to get to 70, 80 w would be a blessing. Uh, but that's actually not their reality. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, 88% of all suicides are less than 45 years of age, 45 years of age and less. The majority of the suicides are actually in the 20s. Age 15 to 35 years of age in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander on this continent, one in three deaths in that age group will be a suicide. That's so the leading. So 30% of the deaths, yeah, approximately. It's 30%. So one in, um, one in three deaths is a suicide. That's the leading cause of death for that age group. If you're 14 years of age and less and an Aboriginal child, an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child, you're actually 8.8 .8 times, let's say nine times, nine times more likely to suicide than a non-Aboriginal child, 14 years and less. And uh, for that age group, it's their second leading cause of death. So we have in this country uh, a moral abomination, an abomination, moral, political and otherwise, where children 14 years and less, uh, their second leading cause of death is uh, suicide for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. And for uh, 15 to 35 year olds, it's their leading cause of death and one in three deaths that's a horrific uh, proportion. One that in three is. deaths is uh, uh, a suicide. And let's also uh, realize that we have to uh, also couple that with unnatural deaths, uh, with uh, uh, deaths from a, uh, uh, premature from a risk-taking nature. That is the, um, uh, the lot of a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. For all the progress that's been made for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the marginalized have got more marginalized. And we've now got high-risk regions. We've got suicides and unnatural deaths at levels that weren't there 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. For instance, in the Kimberley, which has amongst the world's highest suicide rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people when looking at them stand alone, from a cultural lens, from a racial lens, they have amongst the world's highest suicide rates. Similarly so far North Queensland, similarly so many parts of the Northern Territory, and also here in the southwest of Western Australia, the both included, rate is high. Uh, the second highest uh, uh, risk region in Western Australia is actually uh, the southwest. Uh, following uh, the Kimberley. One yes. in four, one in four of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides is in Western Australia. So Western Australia accounts for one in four of all the suicides in this nation, um, and they make up 14% of the total Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. The issues are multifactorial. 
but they all come uh, from a acute disadvantage. Uh, in many of these high-risk regions, we have people corralled uh, in third world akin poverty, something that should not be happening in a, what I described before as a high-income nation, but it does happen. We have racialized economic inequalities. The inability to address these or the, or the hostile uh, uh, incapacity uh, demonstrated by governments to address the uh, racialized economic inequalities translates toxically as racism, as racism yes. for those who are disadvantaged by it. But the irony is that we actually have uh, non-Aboriginal communities, nearby Aboriginal communities that live in relative affluence, that have the full suite of infrastructure, social infrastructure, the lot, and then 50 kilometers away, 100 kilometers away, we have Aboriginal communities that have to beg for clean water, that have to beg for the upgrade of a water tank or their water supply. They'd have to beg for power lines and not get them, and not get them, and have to beg for their school not to be closed because it's said that it's only 30 or 40 kids. But then there are abrig non-Aboriginal communities, townships, that actually have schools with 30 or 40 kids, and they're not under threat of being closed. And they, want, they got water as well. Well, clean water is a natural human um, need. need. And, and, right and to have. And under the... Um, uh, the universal, uh, all the charters and s stuff human like that. Rights. Yeah, the human rights discourses that are out there. Uh, yeah, water, housing, security, all of that um, uh, uh, are now deemed as uh, natural legal rights. But look, in, it, what we actually have is a humanitarian crisis in this country. One in 19 of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, will die by suicide. One in 19. And so, I say it's actually much higher because of underreporting issues. But one in 19 is a humanitarian crisis. That is actually more than 5% of the total population committing suicide. We have the tragedy of Atawaspka in Ontario, Canada, where they've declared a state of emergency because 5% of their total population in the last eight months, and if we extrapolate, it will be 7.5% over the year, uh, have attempted suicide. Have attempted suicide. That, that's horrific. We actually have 5% of our total population registered suicide as suicide. And, and the reality is for each suicide, um, you know, the general trend is to multiply it out by a score of attempted suicides. And uh, look, uh, if you knew the number of attempted suicides that I come across, we actually, you know, sadly, it's not a competition. But we actually outstrip uh, uh, every other nation on the planet in terms of Ab uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander self-harming, uh, attempted suicides and suicides. And I believe the only way forward is a deep examination. How many people in each year commit suicide in Australia by numbers? At the latest one, uh, yes. ABS data, even though we are more uh, availed to much more information, it's getting worse each year, the tally is getting higher. Uh, in the last one, it went up by 300. So we've 300 got th 300 in Australia Australians uh, took their lives further than, uh, uh, than the previous year, the preceding That's year. So 3,000 Australians have taken their lives uh, at the last count, at the last census, 2013. That was in that year. And the year before, it was 2,650-odd or whatever. So right? no, not 300, we got 3,000 every 3,000, so it's gone up by 300. So it's gone up by 300, 300 which is a significant yes. increase, a significant increase. Of so those, 10%. Of those, yeah, of those 150, of the 3,150 are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides. But we've got to understand that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are 2.5% of the total population. Yes. And in terms for them, it's a proportional. And for them, it's a humanitarian crisis. But it, it's a tragedy uh, for all our people. And the reality is suicide takes more lives than the road toll. So you know, what is suicide the Suicide takes more lives. What is the proportion well, between suicide and road toll? Double. It's more than double. It's more than double. Whatever, right. so, so instead of losing 1,500 on the roads, we're losing 3,000 3, by suicide. suicide. And 10% of the suicides committed in here is Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. 150. 150, 150, so 150 it's, odd. It's, yeah. it's 5%. 5%. Look, suicide globally is yes. a, a phenomenon that's a tragedy. And this will actually uh, stagger some people when I put it to them. If we forget the outliers of the world wars where we had tens of millions and hundreds of millions of people Dying, slaughtered, yes. but in general, in general each year, suicide takes more lives globally than uh, all wars and civil strife combined, all gun-related deaths, all uh, domestic violence-related deaths, uh, all homicides. So uh, it is the leading cause of violent death and uh, 
Globally, we have uh, the last count was officially 803,000 suicides globally, according to the World Health Organization report 2014. That's uh, just like here in Australia. Uh, it's it's uh, understated because of... Uh, uh, political reasons? Not necessarily political reasons. Not? Political reasons would factor into it, Tibor. That, that's a reality in some countries in the world that would under the report to you know, hide a tragedy. But it, it's also under reporting issues that have to do with the legal system, criteria being gathered for determinations within uh, the, the coroner's... The uh, cause of death. Yeah in terms of cause of death. A lot of them are put down to unnatural deaths, a lot of them are put down to uh, misadventure and uh, indeterminate death. But the reality so is... We, so we really don't know the real numbers. So we, we know at least it's 800,000 or a million and, uh, and then therefore we presume that it's actually, according to various trends and research that's actually out there, it's probably double that. Whatever, it's probably double that. And that's what we also know about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicide in Australia. My uh, research estimates that instead of the one in 19, that we actually have uh, uh, of deaths that are suicides for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, that in fact it's probably more likely one in 10 to one in 12. But either of those statistics are staggering, one in 19 or one in 10, whether it's 5% or 10%, it should be unimaginable to household Australians uh, in the 12th largest economy on the planet, one of the wealthiest nations on the planet, that we have uh, between 5 and 10% of a total so cultural we, population. Can we imagine that if we got 10%, all Australians commit suicide, then we're going to have 2.5 million deaths. So that's the total population you've uh, calculated yes. the 2.5 million uh, yes. against or whatever. In terms of deaths each year, yeah, 10% would translate. That would cause a huge outcry. It wouldn't be tolerated. We tolerate the shanty towns and the apartheid like uh, dust bowl existences, dustbin existences of a lot of these communities. I've been to Kalgoorlie where we've got Ningamire on the outskirts uh, and that's been allowed to languish for many years where people are living under corrugated iron, no electricity, no water. A local church is their only support. And uh, the family of uh, Reverend Jeffrey Stokes and uh, his pediatrician wife, Dr. Christine Stokes, uh, who tend and care for the, uh, these families. A hundred people, a hundred Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, Wongatha people, are living under corrugated iron. And the government does nothing about it. The local government authority, the state government and the federal government have done uh, next to nothing about that. There's, uh, it's not just limited to uh, that community there. There's other communities. Kalgoorlie is an example. Why I pick Kalgoorlie is 30,000 population. It's got 3,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Now the uh, 30,000 predominant non-Aboriginal population lives relatively well and, and does reasonably okay for itself. Uh, but the 3,000... Uh, Aboriginal, yeah, the, the 3,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population, 300 of them are in the local prison, the Goldfields prison, 300. And 400 are living in one form of homelessness or another. So that's uh, 700, that's nearly one in four, one in four and a half, uh, actually in either homelessness uh, or uh, in jail. Uh, and then we've got the racialized economic inequalities that have led to uh, unemployment and underemployment of these people. And the high levels are atrocious where you've got 80% of the non-Aboriginal population employed. You've only got 40% of the um, Aboriginal population in some form of employment. On that note, we have to go to a short break. But please stay with us because after the break, we're coming back with Jerry, George Artus, with more on suicide prevention. Hello and welcome back to One on One Shadow Boxing. Have your say. We are here at WTV Studios with Jerry Georgiatus, who is a suicide prevention researcher. So we heard these uh, very embarrassing numbers in the first half in Australia. They're, they're the least. There's even much more embarrassing numbers. Uh, and we in Western Australia are the mothers of uh, all the worst. Um, numbers or whatever in terms of the statistical narrative. And the statistical narrative is important because uh, it demonstrates the extensiveness of something that's, um, you know, of a horrific nature. I, I just want to throw a few more numbers yeah. out there or whatever. As I said... But if these are the numbers, and we got a few more numbers, so let us tell what are the other numbers. But if these are the numbers and WA is really the worst in the whole country, why don't our Premier and the Cabinet and the parliament is really care about this because they care about the speeding of the road and having few accidents on the weekends and especially on the long weekends and they're crying their eyes out because of the victims. What's happening with the victims of suicide and the families? Why don't the government is crying and why don't Colin Barnett say something on the 
steps of Parliament House and say, this is my priority. Okay, get to the numbers, Jerry. Well, before I get to numbers, I've got to respond to that. <laughs> but I think you know me well enough to know what I think of politicians and parliamentarians. Our brightest minds aren't in our, our, our governments. Uh, in politics, we've got just about everybody there except those that need to be there or should be there. Look, there's a lot of good and well-meaning people, but they haven't been educated, even those who hold on to portfolios or whatever, right? They're not versed uh, in what they should be. Uh, this is a country that's built up uh, by its uh, academics, by its uh, bureaucrats, and, and uh, who feed to the policy makers. And, you know, uh, they also must take responsibility, not just the politicians who are advised and depend on the policy makers, the bureaucrats, and the academics, or whatever. Right? We are a country in hostile denial of our racism. We are a country uh, in hostile denial of the fact that meritocracy fails people. And, uh, you know, we could get into the financial systems and the way the world works and thinkers or whatever, but financial systems, because they're imbalanced, and because they allow for an accumulation of resources in the hands of the few, whatever right, they allow for these inequalities. But who's actually suffered now generationally without any hope for a long time till recently in bettering the lot for their, um, uh, uh, those to come, their descendants, are actually the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. At least migrants who came to this country had the opportunity to work hard and improve the lot and, uh, uh, for those ahead of them. But they, these people, the Aboriginals and Torres Strait Islanders, they are at home. This is their own country. It is their own we country. couldn't make a relative comparison with other people in this country. They are the owners of this land. They're the owners of the land. And they're not the beneficials of this land. To which for a long time they were dispossessed under the worst forms of eugenics and apartheid and social engineering. That's and just still, still, and not, still, and not, still. In, not in any benefits from this land, but which Plato, is their own land. Plato argued... Plato argued yes. that unless we engage our politicians, we risk being governed by the dumb. And, uh, and that's what we've got to do. You've actually asked that's, me why did these... That's a Greek guy yeah. <laughs> who said that. A uh, wise Greek philosopher who just um, <laughs> you know, said what isn't necessarily rocket science. No, it's but common the, sense. Yeah, it should be common sense. It, it's common sense. But the reality is you asked me a question of why our parliamentarians haven't responded yes, to this humanitarian that's the question, crisis. Because we, we are the, the people who are keeping this land hijacked. We are, we are occupying this country, not in a good term, in a bad term. We, can't we are occupiers. We can't always justify and excuse and defend those who have the reins of power, those who manage our systems, and, and those who should be uh, defining policy in the interests of the common good and all peoples or whatever. Right? Uh, a lot of them have a philosophy. Um, Premier Barnett has come out in the past and said, well, the poor will always be with us. We've just got to accept that. Or whatever, right? You know, so that's a sweep under the carpet, pass the buck, and uh, and uh, you know, don't. It's worse them. than that, yeah. Jerry. Yeah, well, it's what I. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, yes. It's classes. Sorry. Look, we've got classism, and and we've got elitism, and we've got this notion of meritocracy. And you know, my argument would be that many within that meritocracy are unmerited. There's nepotism, which undermines their arguments. Uh, if I could you know, manage, um, you know, the ways forward, that, that would be a whole different level of things, but we'd be argued and held down for redistribution of wealth or even trying to get that on equal terms. I described before the racialized in economic inequalities, and, uh, and there's this argument that they say that they're remote living, a lot of these communities are regional living. Well, I've just said that there's communities out there that live side by side, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities with non-Aboriginal communities, and non-Aboriginal communities are not denied anything. They enjoy the full suite of infrastructure. The Aboriginal communities are denied just about every opportunity. How are they supposed to go forward and navigate the two cultural settings, that of their own and that of the mainstream, when they're denied access they to opportunity? They should navigate our cultural system, not their own cultural system, because they are at home. We are not. And the impact of everything that you described, the dispossession and uh, the apartheid practices and the eugenics of the past that impact to today, have actually led, and this is little known, this is actually little known, one in nine of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living today one in nine nationally have been to prison, have been to prison. One in six of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living Western Australia and the Northern Territory have been to prison, one in six. Today, one in 13 of all Aboriginal adult males in Western Australia is in prison, one in 13. From a racialized lens, Western Australia, when standalone to its Aboriginal um, adult males, has the highest jailing rate in the world. It competes with the African American jailing rate. The highest jailing rate in the world. We're the mother of all jailers. The more west we go across this country, the worse it gets. The hits on the first peoples, the worse the racism. Third worst 
South Australia in terms of the statistical narrative, all the measurement yes. indicators. Second worst in Northern Territory. Worst. Western Australia. Western Australia. Western Australia. But we got all the resources and we got all the wealth, which not even the other part of the country got. And uh, some of the wealthy people think the solution is giving only cards to the aboriginals. They couldn't use cash. And this solves all the problems. Solves nothing. Because in the end, that's actually no, no, part no, no, of the no. problem. Sorry, that's, that's say the billionaire. Basically, we're keeping people who is poor. Using, who is people using the resources of these Aboriginal guys, and he's advising the government how to solve their problem, which is created by us. So that's a obscene. See, what we need in this country is a Royal Commission. And people will argue down a Royal Commission and say it's a waste of taxpayers' monies, and that Royal Commissions have failed us in the past, but it's actually not true. There are Royal Commissions, especially when they pursue corruption, that are very hard to enable um, uh, the Jerry. recommendations and the legislations, but the Royal Commission into the institutional child, um, um, into abuse. the sexual abuse responses institutionally, has actually led to a validation of people's stories, has actually led to a psychosocial benefit, has actually made impermissible what went on for so long to continue on, and has actually also made impermissible the uh, uh, unaccountability of the churches and the orphanages in the equation. And similarly so, the one with the defense forces, with the sexual abuses there that were ritualistic a century long, they've put now to an end. And also the same impermissibility uh, is now designated within that. So I think it's, that is a little bit naive because it's not going to die, none of them, you know, regardless yeah, of the, the royal commissions. However, you see, we couldn't even have a royal commission in the banking system in the end, we've got to, I'll, so, use the uh, word, I'll use the word a little bit of tautology. We'll bank on this. When it comes to financial systems of the world, it's a very sensitive um, raw area because the there's a lot of self-interest. But we've area. got more chance of exacting change with a raw commission about debts, suicides, living conditions, than we actually have about changing the world in terms of its financial systems and regulating the greed uh, of the top end of town. Uh, look, the Royal Commission into Debts and Custodies did actually go forward. It didn't deliver it is, on the enabling. Right, yes. It didn't enable uh, the 339 recommendations from the uh, final report of the Royal Commission 92 from the 1987 to 91 Royal Commission to Aboriginal Debts and Custody. Uh, 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 338 of those recommendations were supported by the Senate. Uh, in the eastern seaboard, in the eastern, in the eastern seaboard, Victoria and New South Wales in particular, 40% have been uh, weighted in. The more west we go across the country, the less. Western Australia, less than 10%, which is an abomination, which is who we are in Western Australia, uh, neoconservatives and, and uh, very merit meritocratic and plutocratic. But some changes were made. And the custody notification service, which has saved lives in terms of the police watch houses in, in uh, the eastern seaboard in New South Wales and the ACT, has led to was a recommendation from the Royal Commission to Aboriginal yes. Deaths in Custody. That has led to zero deaths in police watch houses of First Nations people from 1998 till today. And, uh, and they deal with 15,000 detainees or arrests a year in New South Wales alone. So that's a, uh, yeah, all their lives being saved there. The other thing is that on the table, we have that deep examination from that Royal Commission, and that can always be tapped into. In terms of the suicides, we have not looked multifactorially. We have not looked deep laid. What we've got now is the, our Western Australian Parliament has reduced Josie Farris, the uh, Kimberley parliamentarian, her call for an uh, inquiry uh, to be statewide and to be substantive, they've yes. reduced it to a parliamentary standing committee. That'll be you know, done by the end of the year. We're talking about a few days surface level yes. consultation. Uh, Which is you know, the Nationals nothing. over here through Tony, uh, Terry Redmond argued that we've had 40 reports in the last 10 years. 40 reports from commissioned agencies responding to this and that. These are surface level reports or whatever. These are not a deep examination in the form of a Royal Commission. No, and but how do you want to achieve that to have the Royal Commission on the Torres Strait and Aboriginal, Aboriginal people? Aboriginal Torres Strait the people of... How do you want to achieve that? Well, people of stature, yes. Rosalie Kunis Monks, uh, Toto Sansbury, uh, Drs. Marcus Waters, and many others are actually calling for a Royal Commission because enough's enough. I just described horrific statistics. And uh, the Royal Commission needs to be called in the same manner as the Royal Commission to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was called. And if it takes a couple of years uh, to examine, then so be it. Nothing should be paused on the ground of what uh, needs to be done and should be done. But look, in that Royal Commission will also be discovered a benefit for all Australians. It'll be also uh, non-Aboriginal suicides that'll get mentioned in discuss and discussion. And, uh, and also our... Our migrant populations are always lost in the translation. They have higher suicide rates 
than the, um, we'll just call it, I'll racialize things here, which I don't like doing, but the white population, uh, the white 100-year-old to 200-year-old population. Uh, migrants have higher suicide rates and they're lost in the equation, and, uh, and uh, those of color have higher suicide rates than others. There's a, a number of multifactorial factors that are common and thematic to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicides, and then there's others that are thematic to uh, um, white suicides that actually have to do with expectations. Uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, in a nutshell, it's about a, a, a sense of hopelessness from the beginning of life. For uh, white suicides, it's a sense of failure, a sense of expectations not being met. And because of the onus on migrants to, um, uh, to do well, the pressures upon them, there's a greater sense of uh, that sense of failure when expectations have not been met. And, uh, and there's also the, 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 the toxic translation for them too of racism in, in trying to fit in and in trying to be accepted and validated as a human being. There's a psychosocial disease that we actually have that's born uh, of racism. And racism is a topic that we've only discussed surface level in this country and we have never discussed it in a deep examination. Because we are not racist. <laughs> okay. that's, what, that's, that's what I heard since I arrived in this country. Uh, last question. Prevention. What is the most important thing in prevention of suicide Look, as a we, task? Uh, I, I never mince my words. Two things here. If we want to radically reduce the, uh, the suicides and the self-harming and, and the sense of hopelessness and the psychological distresses and depressions, we need to politically reform, and that takes government. That won't take individuals or responders or those on the ground. Uh, we need to address the racialized economic inequalities, and, and, we, and that will uh, reduce uh, and diminish um, that, that translation. That's uh, prevention. That's racism. That's, yes. But in terms of uh, being practical, and what we all can do on the ground, people need people. In yes. the end, people strengthen people, people can damage people, but people can strengthen people or whatever. The people that I've helped in the course of my time and my work and the lives I've helped to improve and change, that's because I was there for them, as are responders and so forth. So we need to actually well resource the psychosocial, uh, the cultural, uh, the mentors, and the various responders. And we've got to understand there's uh, trauma that's situational, that, uh, but that trauma situational can become ongoing through multiple and composite trauma, and for many, can degenerate into aggressive complex trauma. So it takes a, a whole lot and a whole range of response systems and professionals to, and also the lived experience of others to spread the love and to do the through care. But that also takes governments to fund all that sort of stuff. There's not many people that will do it uh, uh, pro bono. Um, you know, there are people like myself that will always knock themselves out and others to improve a lot of others, but in the end, we're not going to, um, you know, change things. Or, uh, you know, as I tell government, and maybe on this note, finish the program, there is no greater legacy that we can have than to improve a lot of others. And that take, means changing lives to save lives. Thanks, Jerry. You definitely convinced me on the need for Royal Commission in regard to the Aboriginal Torres Strait Island suicides. Don't forget, next week, same time, same channel. Have your say, one-on-one -on -one shadow boxing.